Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And today is October the 22? Yeah. I remember that because yesterday was the 21st and it was our son's birthday. Right. Happy birthday to Chris. <laughs> so um, we are in 2 Corinthians, um, finish up chapter 1 and um, go into chapter 2 which kind of sets, again, the historical narrative of the stage of what this letter is doing, where it's going, the great um, theology that comes out of this really begins at the end of chapter 2 and into chapter 3, 4, 5, and the beginning of chapter 6. If you remember when we did Galatians, remember we took a detour and we did 2 Corinthians chapters 3, 4, 5, and the beginning of chapter 6 during the Galatians class is how it, it fit um, what we were talking about there. Well, you might remember it when we get um, into that chapter. The, the glory of the Lord of the covenant, um, where Mo, Moses' glory, uh, radiating the glory of God versus Christ's um, glory, which is eternal and not fading. And then the, we have that in us in jars of clay. Here we are. Uh, people who are just, or, we are ordinary jars of clay, but inside of us is that treasure of the glory of God, the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And then, that, and then, we're, and then in five, chapter 5, so therefore we have this ministry of reconciliation. We are, we are his ambassadors, literally, not just with the message, but with the very glory of God himself dwelling in us and flowing out of us. That is... Now, when you put that into the context of this whole letter from beginning to end, that what the, 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 the letter begins with, what do I have to boast about? And then he kind of discusses it in terms of the way that, that the, these uh, false apostles are boasting. And then at the end of the book, he's, he says, I have nothing to boast about except the cross of Christ. His grace is sufficient for me. I'll boast then from now on only in my weaknesses. And then, but this, but this uh, section in the middle, which we're about to come to, chapters three, four, five, and and part of six, um, ex explains why that is. It's because it's because Christ Himself, the risen Christ, who is the glory of God, now dwells within us, not just with us, but in us. And uh, so it's it's no longer us. Our confidence is not in who we are, what we can do in the body and in the flesh, but it's in the one who now dwells in us. And that's, that's real. It's not um, just some uh, spiritual platitudes that we take. And I, I mean to say that, uh, um, I, don't, <laughs> I would be careful not to get off on a sermon on this right now, <laughs> then we, we lose our time. But, but you know how um, I, I just, I can't get, I, uh, I, get, a, I get a bad stomach uh, watching too many uh, like Hallmark movies and um, romance, this and that. Somebody dies and they pass away, and then everybody's there, you know, and they're sorrowing, and they're grieving, and stuff, which is which is good and it's tr and it's true. But then you know, um, the uh, they're we're consoling each other with the fact that they're always with us, and they'll always be with us. Their spirit is always with us. Well, I hate to. <laughs> you know, I, I hate to dis I don't mean to discourage you with the fact, but they can't see what we're doing, and they're, they're in a different place, and, and they don't know what's, what we're doing. But uh, the, the Bible does not indicate that. Uh, and uh, if there's anything with you, it's a memory, and it might and it might be some of the things of, of that were God used in their life to in, to impress on you and to build in you like seeds that are watered <clears throat> but they themselves aren't here now you know now let's not, let's not play uh, games with you are and because we feel like we have to uh, you know uh, ass assuage our emotions and make make and not and not feel bad about so we come up with these these dream things but if you have Christ, you don't need to do that and play those games. We're going to be together with him. Jesus is, in fact, in us. Not the memory of him, 
not just the wonderful good thoughts I have about the way it would have been if I would have walked with him 2,000 years ago like the 12 did. And man, you know, and now because I've got the written record, I can do the same thing. And it's like I'm walking with him. No, he is absolutely, literally as if... It, uh, you mean, do you mean physically? Well, I may, maybe, I, but I mean better than physically. Remember Paul was in the, in the third heaven in uh, chapter 12, and he said, <coughs> whether in the body or out of the body, I'm not sure, I don't know whether it was in the body, whether the body was with me or not, but I know one thing, I was there in his presence, and this is what I heard, this is what I saw. So it's more real than uh, to, to, to take the revelation of the Lord and to know him, to see him, and to, to be in his presence and to have him and to have that knowledge of him, what he calls the knowledge of <coughs> the glory of God in the face of Christ, is a reality. <clears throat> it's not a good thought, a romantic thought. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's a reality. Jesus lives in me. If any man is in, in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has become. All things become new because it isn't me turning over a new leaf and changing me. It is Him doing the work in me and changing me. And that comes from 2 Corinthians 5, 17. So I'm kind of summarizing and putting this whole thing together in this, um, this letter of, of Corinthians. And remember, um, right alongside of my NIV study Bible here, which... Um, we want everybody to have one. We still have a few. I, there's, a, there's two or three back there, and there's um, another three or four in my office. These, these are free. If you don't have an NIV study Bible, they, but the ones that we have here, they're free because they have a flaw. Now, nobody wants to have a, a flawed copy of the Bible. <laughs> but uh, what do you do? Throw it in the dumpster? <laughs> you know? It's good for something. 98% of it is still there. But each one of those NIV study Bibles has about 10 to 20 pages of that either are missing or upside down. Um, so if you want, um, grab one of those. I'm, I'm guessing that, um, you know, if, if you get one where it's in Ezekiel and you're, you know, that's, or something that's, uh, or the Minor Prophets, and it's, then um, it's better than, getting one where like the whole gospel of Matthew is missing or something like that. But, um, but if you don't have an NIV, NIV study Bible, grab one of those. That's a, at least a good start to have most of it. That's the best in the English language, the best translation, the original NIV of 1984. Uh, as I mentioned before to, to uh, our class earlier, not everybody here was has heard this before, so I'll say it again, but the NIV's the recent NIV passed about 2011. Um, the, the, the company was purchased by, uh, from, from Zondervan now, I think by somebody else, and they changed their uh, translating um, uh, guidelines, and now they've gone to changing, uh, making, uh, the biggest problem with it is making things gender neutral so as not to offend uh, modern people. Well, uh, we, as soon as we start messing with the translation, and we're not giving an accurate rendering of what the Hebrew and Greek said, it, it's time to put that on the shelf. So I don't, I don't, I don't endorse or recommend the NIRV, the New International Revised Version, or which is uh, they, they, that's packaged and published a lot for children, uh, or it's the newer translations of the NIV. So the, I'm, I'm sadly, um, the study Bible notes are still great, but um, newer, uh, newer ones have tampered with it. So I go with the, the original NIV of uh, 1984, and then the other one is the New American Standard Bible, which I'm, I'm going to use right here this morning. And this is a key word study Bible. It has the Greek and Hebrew dictionaries in the back. Thank you, Lucy, for getting me this a few years ago. I remember, but, um, 
it, the, the, the key word study Bible comes in the NASB and in the King James Version. The New American Standard Bible is, is uh, probably the most accurate in the English language. Uh, it still uses these and thous only in reference to God, but all the other these and thous have been replaced to modern. But it's the most literal to the Hebrew and Greek. Um, that is available in English. It's not ex exactly as readable as the NIV. The NIV reads more like a, a newspaper or a magazine which is in the, which is written on a sixth grade level. The NASB is written on a, about a 12th grade level. Um, you would think that most people in America are high school graduates, but sadly, that doesn't mean a whole lot anymore. A <laughs> high school graduate today can't write a research paper <laughs> and couldn't hardly pass an SAT test. Um, so that has all been dumbed down. But anyway, um, I'm digressing. Uh, the, um, this is a great place to study, and we're here to do Bible study. Um, these are the best tools. The, the Keyword Study Bible has um, the nouns and verbs are underlined with a four-digit number next to it, which is keyed to the Hebrew dictionary or Greek dictionary, if it's a New Testament, in the back. So you can get exactly what... It's like reading it in the Hebrew and Greek without knowing the, the original languages. Um, so in this, he gives a little bit of a... Um, uh, a little bit of an uh, introductory paragraph on the... Um, the key word, which, by the way, I should also note that I believe that the that the footnotes in the in the in the keyword study Bible are all about the philology, which means it's a fancy word for it means what the words mean, what the original word Greeks, what the original Greek word meant, what the original Hebrew word meant in the Old Testament, and that's what the footnotes are pretty much confined to, where. And uh, the other study Bible, and maybe you're going to get historical background, um, um, how this fits in with other scriptures and stuff like that. Um, so the notes on this were done, I, I do believe, by uh, Spiro Zodiades, yeah, executive editor of the Hebrew Greek. Spiro Zodiades is uh, uh, recognized as probably the premier. Uh, expert in, in the New Testament Greek in the, the Bible. So he put this together, the Keyword Study Bible, did, did an excellent job. Now I just lost my page. Let's see. All right. And this um, introduction here, it just kind of reiterates a little bit of what we already went through, but I'll just to remind you about the fact that this letter we're beginning here. Except for Paul's letter to Philemon, which is just a like a one page, 12 verse or something, little letter uh, to Philemon to let go his prisoner, Onesimus. Uh, 2 Corinthians is the least systematic and the least doctrinal of Paul's letters and the most personal letter that he wrote outside of Philemon, which was just a letter to an individual. Paul's intense emotion and fiery personality are revealed here more clearly than in any other epistle. It is full of digressions and meanderings as far as topics. I mean, it seems like going all over the place. Don't you like it when the, when the preacher in the pulpit goes all over the place and you go like, what did you talk about this morning? <laughs> I don't know, but it was good. But, <laughs> but what was, you know, what was the thing? You know, you made a few good points, but what, how did it all fit together? I don't know. You know, like he talked everything about um, the second coming to uh, communion to uh, everything else in between. Uh, Paul kind of does that here because it's personal in nature, and he's speaking to correct, to admonish, to exhort. Um, and to build up the Christians there where they, uh, uh, they need uh, to get their minds in the right place and their hearts right in serving the Lord and some of the issues that they're facing in their church. 
Um, so that kind of explains uh, about that. Plus, he's having to uh, defend himself or against many uh, accusations and things to where he was being pulled down by um, other teachers who tried to raise himself up and take his place after he had left town. Um, so, um, okay, so he tells us of some very personal experiences such as his vision of the third heaven in chapter 12 and of his thorn in the flesh also in chapter 12. Throughout the letter there is a strong undercurrent of defensiveness. He is being attacked and felt forced to justify his authority against false legalistic teachers who had meddled in his work. He warned the congregation against certain errors, instructed them in matters of duty as Christians and expressed his happiness that they heeded what he had to say in 1 Corinthians. But the real watchword of 2 Corinthians is that we must all be loyal to Christ, not to human personalities. And that was a, still a major theme of 1 Corinthians. If you remember, 1 Corinthians began with uh, rebuking the church for being divided over. I, I, some said, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, and I follow this teacher, I follow Christ. <clears throat> and is, is Christ divided? So we're, it's not the, the human personalities that we follow. It is the truth. And everyone who's doing the work of Christ, as Paul did, values truth more than his own um, position and more than his own opportunity to be there and to speak it. It's not about what I am or who I am because the truth precedes me. It was there before I got on the scene. I just got hooked up to it and I just got a little sliver of it. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm just sharing what he's given to me. And I have to stay in that flow. I have to stay abiding in him. Um, and that is usually the case with the ones that stay humble enough to say that we need one another. And it's not only um, God's ministry or God's anointing through one man. It should never result in that. And that's why, by the way, um, we at this church believe in... Uh, in elder rule, elder governing, not not in uh, the. There's two opposite extremes. At one point, I'm going to have to probably share this from the pulpit here, um, as we go forward. But there's two opposite extremes. There's the there's the churches where there's a one man show, like a pyramid. Everything goes to the top. You got your, you know, your teachers. You got your then elders who oversee. You got deacons who are usually um, doing the physical needs that the elders let them know this needs to be done and that needs to be done. So elders go and I mean the deacons uh, uh, wait tables and uh, and maybe go fix things at somebody's house uh, that needs it. Uh, the elders are overseers; they oversee the spiritual uh, matters of the church. Um, what God is saying, where God is directing us, uh, vision, as well as looking at uh, the spiritual needs of individuals in the body who need attention, things that need attention, whether it's a, re a rebuke or reproof or an admonition, or or raising somebody up who is who's showing a real calling, and then and then you've got pastors who are more of the mouthpieces, um, but we so. You, you've got all of these different functions and there's levels of responsibility but it doesn't necessarily translate into levels of, of um, importance or value. There's the difference. Uh, in other words, it's like this. You got a home, you got a dad, you got a mom, which are also husband and wife. To each other, they're husband and wife. To the whole family, they're mom and dad. And then you have children, but amongst those children, they're not all the same unless you have quadruplets. Then they're all the same at the same level. But for most of us, 90% of us, you got one at a time, and um, we don't usually have a litter, but it happens. Um, but you've got a child who might be, you know, 10, another one who's 8, another one who's 7, another one who's 5. A three-year-old, and then just a newborn. Well, usually when you got a when you got a when you got a tribe that big, 
the older ones are going to have more responsibility in helping, in helping mom and dad care for the younger ones. And that's just the way it is because they're more, de they're more mature developmentally and so they need to be given more responsibility based upon that maturity level. They're farther along in their developmental level because they've been there longer. They have more experience. And hopefully that experience is because of obedience to the father and the mother so that they have learned the father's will and understand what the father's will is in relation to my other siblings and that they can help carry out what the, the parents' uh, agenda is to the other siblings, not their own. You ever notice that when an older child starts to take mom and dad's place, things are a little different than the way mom and dad would do them if mom and dad isn't around? And uh, because, uh, boy, they, they're going to relish in that fact that I, I get to wield mom and dad's authority on you, on you little guys now. And they can be extremely harsh about it because um, that's the nature of man. And uh, we do that. We, so we have two extremes. We have, we have in churches, in churches all over the place, and this is even in evangelical Bible-believing churches. One is we don't want anybody over anybody, so we have the congregation vote. Well, the problem with that is it's like, do you have mom, dad, the 16-year-old, the 8-year-old, and the 3-year-old all vote with the same weight of authority about what we're going to do as a family? Now, a good leader in the home, as a dad would, is going to listen to them all and know all of their needs. Proverbs says, know the condition of your flock. And then in the, do, in the harvest time, you'll have plenty of wool. So you've got to know everybody and know what the needs are. But... Do you let the three-year-old tell us where we're going to go or what we're going to have for dinner? We're all having Skittles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one man, one boat. Right. <laughs> so, no, you don't do that. So, and, now, and not everybody that's in the congregation is sitting there is able to discern who is a spiritual leader and who is just a strong personality. They're not able to make those decisions. So we don't leave decisions in the hand of the membership general. The Bible doesn't teach that and never shows that. It shows leadership from apostolic authority, and uh, and that so so that eliminates the the democracy style of of church government. That's Western. That's American. It's not New Testament. The other extreme on the other side is to have a from the top down hierarchy, where these guys report to the you know uh, deacons report to the elder elders report to the and there is there is lines of maturity level spiritually, just like I said, your 16-year-old is farther along than your 8-year-old, and he's farther along than your 3-year-old. Um, but And so that you do have those recognized positions, but we don't ever want to get to the place where we have one guy at the top that makes the final, has the final decision and the final word for all, because we need to see... Uh, in that, in, set, in that sense, there needs to be a plurality of, of pastors or elders who all see the same thing and that there's a unity there so that it's not one uh, person's dominating all of it because none of, we all see in part and we all know in part. Now, uh, and this is where Matthew 18 would come in. Matthew 18 would come in if some, some, one brother offends another brother in the church, and it's going to happen, you're going to have sibling fights. Sometimes the, you know, um, the six-year-old is, is going is to poke and provoke his, uh, his brother who's just like one year older than him, and he feels like he should have the same right, and he's going to provoke him until his last nerve, until he responds and gets him in trouble, and then he steps back and watches him get in trouble with mom and dad, you know. And he's like, a, <laughs> you know, and those kind of things happen in the body of Christ because um, we have these, we, we, these, uh, so what Jesus says in, in, when that happens, when they're in Matthew 18, there's a proper procedure and protocol for when uh, an offense occurs uh, one against another. And that is, first of all, you go to that brother and show him. Uh, where he has hurt you, 
if they don't respond to that, or if they refuse that, then you take another person along with you. Then you call the elders of the church at least two. Not just one, but at least two. So that, and Jesus says this, so that by everything, uh, so, that in, so that everything will be cited, be decided by the witness of at least two or three. And uh, that way, it, uh, see, the elders are all seeing, none of us are the Lord himself, and he's with us, but he works through us. But none of us is, there's a phrase that the Catholics use for the Pope, it's the vicar of Christ. When the Pope sits on that seat, he is Christ's, not just his representative, because we are all his representatives, we're all his ambassadors, but he's sitting in Christ's almost like authoritative position over the rest of the church. That is not, that's not, what, that's not the position of authority Jesus gave to Peter or to the Pope or at all. He, he gave it to the apostles, and the apostles convened in Acts 15, Remember the Jerusalem Council when they had to decide what to do with Gentile believers? They all convened and they prayed and fasted together until the Lord showed them together the answer to that question. And that's what elders need to be doing. It forces them to not dominate one over the other, but it forces them to listen to one another about what the Lord is saying as we uh, lay down what the, the, the little light that each one of us has before God. I'll tell you what, having a board that operates like that is hard to find and it's difficult to do because men are, we're, we are men and we have strong wills and we have stubborn minds and we are tend to be occupied with what we want to do and see accomplished. We have our, and we can be headstrong, you know, just think of the boss at work. You know, who's sometimes you get guys that are willing to listen, and other times you guys, any question at all is, is a threat to his authority. And you can't ask him a question at all. That's just the way people are. Well, you want that the more spiritual a person is, the less he is of self and the more he is of willing to serve, and his mindset isn't on self. That's one of the qualifications of leading as an elder. So two, two extremes. The one... And many churches operate with the CEO model. Of the, the pastor is the anointed of the Lord here. He's the one that we should all follow. And we all get, well, yes and no. Yes, but it's, it's, Paul always commanded, or he instructed Timothy, to appoint elders in all the churches that we have started all, all over Asia. Elders, plural. There's a plurality of elders and leadership in the church. Um, and we will, and those who are elders and pastors will give an account for your souls, the souls of those who they are leading and shepherding. Um, sorry for that digression. Oh, that's good teaching. I, another downside to having the CEO is if they, if they get compromised or corrupted, yeah. they'll corrupt the whole body. Right. Yeah. There's no um, exact check. checks and balances. Yeah. And if they're wrong about... Uh, uh, there's no uh, about a secondary doctrine that's not an essential to the faith. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no now most churches that have that model do have um, they have measures to be taken if the if their pastor uh, goes astray. But in the day to day operations, you still have um, you know um, you're bound to the. But whatever the belief system is and the ideas are and whatever the direction is of one person rather than mm -hmm. um, the vision should be created by uh, by a plurality or, or a multiple mm -hmm. uh, board of uh, leadership. That's why we call it elder rule. And, and, and then on this other subject, but accountability to one another. Accountability. Mm -hmm. There's nobody who should not be accountable. Like a lone wolf. And what they well, and then what the you know the the super Pentecostals often follow into this with the uh, because uh, uh, with the one man because they're looking at the anointing this that brother so and so is the, is God's man of the hour he's the he's the anointed uh, he's got the anointing on him where we should follow that you know the spirit is all over him so that's it. Uh, 
well, the Spirit is all over all of us. He lives in us. Um, and uh, well, th what they'll do is, well, we've got the denomination. We've got the denomination. So if he goes astray, uh, some of the boards might, might call the denomination the district uh, leaders or the bishops or whoever's you know, over that over the, that group of churches. And uh, but so there's there's uh, ways to remove a guy. But do you really does it should it wait till there's a doctrinal issue or a moral problem with the guy? No, there should always be uh, accountability with one another. In, uh, in that you, we are forced to recognize one another's giftings and strengths. Like this pastor is a, is a teacher, this other pastor is not. Not all pastors are teachers. A lot of them are great evangelists, but they're pastors. Uh, some of them don't. Some pastors have, not, have no ability to evangelize because they're all about building up the flock that's right there, their people, persons with the people that are right there for them. Um, but don't speak well to the lost. So there's different giftings and callings. The best churches are those that have people that are gifted in these all various areas, but they're allowed to work in concert with each other, not in competition with each other. So anyway, um, enough on that. Now that we've said that, we... <laughs> what does that have to do with Genesis? <laughs> it needs to be said, uh, but um, well, Paul is dealing with this, isn't he? He's dealing with um, guys that, and this is the early church. Isn't it interesting, the church that just um, was created, these churches are all brand new. This is the first century. This is probably written in the you know, late 50s. Jesus went, uh, ascended to heaven around 30 to 32 A.D., so this is only about 25 years after Christ has gone. It's very early in the church's formation and these churches have just been um, created within the last dozen years or so. So they're dealing with the same issues and we have the same issues today in the churches. Worldliness, um, uh, disputes, people that... Um, uh, ministers that dispute with each other and want and, one, and uh, teaching, raising uh, up those that want to be prominent but don't want to serve, and all of that stuff. The the miss the use and misuse of the gifts of the spirit. <laughs> we've we've gone through that. It's not and uh, and it's still possible to go through it again if we, if we don't pay attention. Um, they dealt with all of that. So anyway, let's go ahead and read. Um, I'm going to read uh, through the first couple chapters. are really short. And let us um, have a couple of us. All right. Let's have somebody volunteer again and read the first 11 verses here. And then somebody read 12 to 24. All right, Kathy. Second. <laughs> I volunteer <with> Lucy. <laughs> oh, that's twelve through what? The second. Twelve to twenty-four. Okay, I'll do twelve to twenty. All right, good, good. All right, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. To the church of God in Corinth, together with us, all the saints throughout Achaia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow in over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. 
We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. Now this is our boast, our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially in our relations with you and the holiness and sincerity that are from God. We have done so not according to worldly wisdom, but according to God's grace. For we do not write you anything you cannot read or understand. And I hope that as you have understood us in part, you will come to understand fully that you can boast of us just as we will boast of you in the day of the Lord Jesus. Because I was confident of this, I plan to visit you, first so that you might benefit twice. I plan to visit you on my way to Macedonia, and to come back to you from Macedonia, and then to have you send me on my way to Judea. Judea, I'm sorry. When I plan this, did I do it lightly, or do I make my plans in a worldly manner, so that in the same breath, I say yes, yes, and no, no. But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes, no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by me, and Silas, I believe, and Timothy was not yes and no. But in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are, yes, in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what it is to come. I call God as my witness that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth, not that we lord it over or faith, but we work. Okay. Okay, so and then um, let's continue. Um, Lucy, you could you read the um, first 11 verses there in chapter 2? Okay. Um, where you left off, but we work with you for your joy, because it is by faith you stand firm. So I made up my mind that I would not take another painful visit to you. For if I grieve you, who was left to make me glad, but you whom I have grieved. I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I should not, have, I should not be distressed by those who ought to make me rejoice. I had confidence in all that you, of you that you would all share my joy. For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent not to put it too severely. 
the punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient for him. And instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, reaffirm your love for him. The reason I wrote to you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not aware of his scheme. We are not unaware of this. Okay. Now, when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who is always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ, and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are the smell of death. To the other, the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit, on the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity, like men sent from God. Um, when he didn't find his brother Titus there, whom he had left there, um, he was disappointed, but he thinks God always leads us in, tri in triumphal procession. Wherever we find ourselves, whatever the difficulties, whatever the disappointments, it is Christ in us. And um, this is kind of an answer to the boasting that he... Uh, was speaking about that he had to do it um, and here is the beginning of what uh, his answer is to the problems who is sufficient who is adequate for these things me you that cry, that God would that the very presence and knowledge of God flow out of any one of us is that is that because of anything that you have done that you have earned <coughs> by your walk, by your holiness, by your dedication? No, it is received by faith. The fact that I've received Christ by faith, I've received a position, but I've received a life, and it is now the life of God in me, so that when somebody's next to you, they smell the cologne that you splashed on that day. It's a, it's a fragrant, of aroma. I smell Jesus when I'm around you. I see him, I feel him. There's a... Uh, I sense him because Jesus is in you and it's no longer you that's living trying to do good things but it's the reality of the life of Christ in you who is sufficient for that no one but it's Christ in me and that's the one I'm going to boast in that it's Christ in me so that's that's um, this is where we begin with the power of God in a life that is transformed because of Jesus Christ in us and we are this new creation so we get to see what Paul talked about is that in, in Galatians at the end that it is not being religious, circumcised, or unreligious, uncircumcised, but what matters is a new creation. Now in 2 Corinthians, we're going to see that lived out in action, in, in real circumstances of life and why that is. So this is, um, this is what's cool about that. Um, all right, folks, we're being... Um, we're being compelled and compelled to run downstairs by, by the uh, trumpets and the, and, and the sounds of the Levites. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you for your words, Lord, that give, give us uh, light for the path and instruction and, um, <clears throat> and motivation. We want to be compelled, Lord, by more of love for you. Um, as it's you doing your work in us, you're the one that has drawn us, Lord. We want to do nothing of ourselves. We want to just be people who are, uh, our hearts are tender and hungry 
for more of Christ in our lives. That you do, doing the transforming of our mind and of our thoughts, Lord, that we'll think your thoughts. Fill us with your spirit that what is seen out of us, uh, Lord, is that transformed life, Lord God, a, a renewed life of Jesus in us. That our family would see you, our kids, our grandkids, all those around us that we touch, Lord, would not see us, but Jesus living your life in us and through us. And that is the true and the normal Christian life. We pray, Father, that you'd <coughs> encourage us <coughs> through your words and let us speak your words, Lord, more fully and more boldly and freely with those around us, not being afraid of, um, of people's um, response forward or, or negative towards it, but Lord being compelled by what your purpose is towards them. We ask that you'd help us to see all things and bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and direct our steps. Fill us with your presence as you inhabit the praises of your people this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.